software. In fact, it contains a small GNU slash Linux system. And many people in the free software community applauded the TiVo when it came out. They said, ah, they're using our software. How nice of them. Which is sort of backwards, you see. It should be how nice for them. Everybody's welcome to use our software, but when they do, they are benefiting from us. That's not giving us something, that's receiving from us. We should make a distinction between the people who benefit from our work and from benef between benefiting from our work and contributing to our work. And we should thank people when they contribute. We don't have to thank them when they get the benefits of our work. Then they should thank us. Meanwhile, the TiVo also contains non-free software and it spies on the user. And this shows us that the goal should not be that products use free software, meaning use some free software. The goal has to be use no non-free software, reject non-free software completely. And that's the aim of, of the free software movement. We want to escape from non-free software and we want to help the whole world escape from non-free software forever. So, malicious features don't stop with spying. Some malicious features are designed to restrict the user. There's the functionality of refusing to function. Where the program says, I don't want to show you this file. I don't want to let you copy this file. I don't want to print this file for you because you're not good enough. This is also known as DRM, Digital Restrictions Management, where the program is designed to refuse to work for you. <clears throat> and then there are back doors. Now, there was a proprietary program called Interbase, which was liberated. And once it was free software, the users looked at the source code and they saw it had a back door. So they took it out. They fixed it. But when it was proprietary, the users couldn't tell. It presumably had the same back door, perhaps for years. But the users had no way to discover this. They were vulnerable. Another proprietary program with a back door that you might have heard of is called Windows XP. <laughs> When Windows XP asks for an upgrade, Microsoft knows the user's identity. So Microsoft can deliver to the user an upgrade designed specifically for her, which means it can take total control of her computer and do whatever it wants. That's the back door we know about. Is there another? In India, I was told that they had arrested some programmers working on development of Windows XP and accused them of working also for Al-Qaeda, saying that they were trying to put in another backdoor that Microsoft was not supposed to be aware of. Apparently, that attempt failed. Was there another attempt that succeeded? We have no way of checking. We can't tell. And Microsoft was also caught putting in a back door for the National Security Agency back in 1999. So you can't trust non-free software. This is not to say that all developers of non-free software put in malicious features. The point is you can't tell Non-free software is trust me software. Just trust me. So even though 
There are some proprietary software developers that don't do this. You can't really tell who they are, so you can't ever trust them. Meanwhile, those non-free software developers that do sincerely try to develop the program to run so as to serve the user's wishes are still human, so they make mistakes. They write errors in their code. They can't help it. And the user is just as helpless against an accidental error, an unintentional error in the code, as he is against a deliberate malicious feature. If you use a program without freedom number one, you're a prisoner of your software. We, the developers of free software, are human too. We also make mistakes. There are errors in our programs also. All non-trivial programs have bugs. The difference is that we respect your freedom to fix the bugs in our code. We don't keep you a prisoner of our mistakes, let alone our malice, because we d believe in respecting your freedom. You are free to change our code. What, for whatever reason you don't like what it does, you are free to change it. <clears throat> And free software is generally entirely free of malicious features. And the reason is, programmers think of putting in malicious features when they believe they can get away with it. The developer of a proprietary program already has power over the users. So he faces the temptation to put in a malicious feature knowing the users can't take it out. But we free software developers, even if you suppose that we were tempted in the same way, that if, even if we suppose that our consciences are not stronger than the other people's, we realize we can't get away with it. Because we know the users would find the malicious features and take them out. We don't have power, so we can't force our malicious features on you. And we know this, so we don't try. So, these are the reasons why Freedom One is essential. Freedom One is the freedom to personally study the source code and change it to do what you want. But Freedom One is not enough because there are millions of people who use computers and don't know how to program. They can't personally exercise freedom number one. But even for us programmers, freedom number one is not enough because there's just too much software. In fact, there's too much free software. There's so much free software that nobody could possibly master all the, f the software that she uses and make personally all the changes that she might want to make. That's beyond the capacity of one human being. So the only way we can fully take control of our software and make all the changes that we want is to do it working together, cooperating. And for this we need freedom three. The freedom to publish or distribute modified versions when you wish. The freedom to help your community. With this freedom, we can work together. Suppose there are a million users of a certain free program, and they want a, a million users who want a certain change. There might be 10 million others who don't care, but a million people want the change. Well, by chance, we'd expect there will be some thousands of them that know how to program. One of these days, a few of them will make the change using Freedom 1, and then they will publish their modified version, which is exercising Freedom 3. And then all those million people can switch to that version and get the change